Good afternoon. My name is Sally McKenzie, and uh, we want to thank you for coming, welcome you here, and uh, we are very eager to tell you a little bit about the Decadal Vision Plan that's been developed for uh, supportive plant science. Uh, and we're also very interested in hearing from you about this Decadal Vision because, of course, this is a conversation we hope to have with the plant science community and with the general community about our priorities. Uh, but before I do, I just want to uh, take a moment to thank uh, AAAS for the opportunity to uh, use their beautiful facility here and for their support. We also want to thank the American Society of Plant Biologists, the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society uh, of America, Soil Science Society of America, and American Chemical Society for their support of this event as well. So um, a couple of years ago, the members of the plant science community uh, joined forces as we saw many realities coming together, one being that climate change was becoming increasingly uh, a threat and a perceived threat uh, to the agricultural community in the US. Uh, at, the, at the very same time, we were starting to realize that resource depletion in our agricultural system was becoming increasingly problematic, uh, not only water, but of course phosphate is a, a really critical issue. And we were also seeing several plans, several uh, proposals and uh, um, documents being developed that were being circulated, particularly around Washington, D.C., and policymakers regarding uh, changes in life sciences. And the plant science community felt we needed to be part of that discussion. So two events were held that we're going to describe to you in which um, much deliberation uh, went on amongst the plant science community as to how we could bring uh, together our own uh, voice as one voice from the community on what we felt were the priorities. Priorities means that there will be those ideas that get left out. Priorities will mean that um, we won't be able to cover everything. But in prioritizing, we were able to then start to uh, rally around concepts that we felt could really bring about meaningful uh, uh, change to uh, uh, the opportunities or the uh, solutions that we had to offer for some of these problems. So we're going to tell you a little bit about what came out of those two meetings, some of the priorities. And we're not simply going to walk you through the document, but hopefully all of you have had the opportunity to look at this document. Instead, we want to tell you a little bit about our perspectives on how that document was developed and how very important we think issues, these issues will be when it comes to uh, solving some of the problems that we're going to be facing over the next, not just the next decade, but over the next 35 years as we uh, quickly approach 9 billion on this earth. Uh, so with that, we, our first speaker is going to be David Stern, who is the president of Boyce Thompson Institute uh, in Ithaca, New York. And David's going to also one of the co-authors of this document, uh, who's going to describe a little bit about how this document was developed. Um, so David. Thank you, Sally, and thanks to all of you again for coming. Uh, it's been a really interesting process for me to go through uh, the process of producing this report and interacting with the community to do so, and also with policymakers and interested folks uh, uh, here in Washington and elsewhere. So uh, my job is going to be to set the context for the science discussions that will follow. And let me see how that works. OK, that's me. OK, so let me just reiterate why the plant science community decided to develop a decadal vision. One uh, reason, the top line reason, is really the opportunities for plant research to address grand challenges in society. So um, the reports that are sprinkled around this slide are reports that came out of Washington, D.C. On, on the bottom and on the, on the uh, right side. And the top report is actually an international report reminding us that plant science is international and not just national. These reports aren't necessarily about plant science. The two on the bottom, for example, are New Biology for the 21st Century and the Bioeconomy Blueprint. What's interesting about those reports is how many times they call on plant scientists to provide parts of the solution. In the bioeconomy, for example, it's obvious the new biology one again talks about environmental issues and, and agriculture. So plant scientists are being called on to help solve critical problems in society, and we needed to answer the call, and that's one of the impetus for the decadal vision. The, the solutions are complicated. They're interdisciplinary. They involve everything from engineering to physics to math and, of course, in biology. 
one has to really have a vision in order to accomplish solutions that cut across very disparate fields. One can't do it uh, in one-off research projects. This is all against a backdrop of a stagnant um, or even declining investment in some aspects of research in, in the U.S., not in just in plant research, but certainly in plant research. What happens is that funding becomes uh, more precious, uh, requiring us to do more with each dollar, but it also disincentivizes young people from getting into um, the sciences. And America's future is really going to be built on technology and knowledge. And if the pipeline is leaky, if young folks in the next generation don't see the opportunities and don't see the promise of going into science and going into plant research, then um, we will lose our place and we will, uh, we will not have a, a good future. So the Decadal Vision is designed in part to answer that call by uh, stimulating the pipeline and by uh, rebuilding that pipeline of youngsters, the next generation of plant scientists. So if we have a decadal vision, do we have any idea that a decadal vision will work? And I know a lot of you are probably familiar with the, the astronomers and the astrophysicists' decadal vision. Every 10 years they do a survey and they say, look, we can't do everything. Dollars are too precious. What is going to give us the biggest return on investment? What is the biggest priority? And that community decides what to do. And so the idea of a decadal vision for plants is, again, to decide what will have the biggest impact. Now, the plant, uh, another decadal vision that you could say delivered on its promise was the human genome. So on the bottom here is some sequence from the human genome. You all have that sequence or some version of it. In 10 years, that genome was produced. And the impact, the economic, the medical, societal impact of having that sequence is, is, uh, is, is incalculable. It has been calculated that something like a 42 to 1 return on the dollars. But um, that decadal plan also was realized. I also want to refer to the Arabidopsis 2010 initiative. Most of you know that Arabidopsis is the, is the lab rat of a plant biologist. It's kind of a, a mustard plant. And from the period 20, 2000 to 2010, uh, the National Science Foundation decided to fund a, a, a significant program that would determine the function of every gene in Arabidopsis once that sequence had been determined. And in 10 years, the amount of fundamental knowledge on plant biology that was gained through that initiative, again, is incalculable. It changed the world of plant uh, science and in some senses uh, set the foundation for the decadal vision that we're here to talk about today. So if this is such a great thing to do, why hasn't the plant community done it before? One of the most important reasons, if you will, is that the plant community is so diverse. So I have a picture here of uh, John Muir on the bottom, uh, Barbara McClintock uh, in a field of corn, Nobel laureate for her work in plant genetics, and then Joe Ecker, kind of the master of uh, Arabidopsis up there on the top right. Now, you could argue that all three of these are plant biologists, but they certainly aren't the same. They're very diverse. One cares about natural systems, one cares about uh, agriculture, if you will, and another cares about the very fundamental aspects of plant growth and development. <clears throat> so because plant biologists are so diverse, they've tended to rally in smaller silos or groups around, for example, the species or around a process such as um, root growth or bioenergy, or they rally around cell biology or molecular biology or structural biology or ecosystem biology. And as a result, these different silos, if you will, of plant scientists have tended to go in their own groups for resources, and it, and it precludes really a common vision if each faction, if you will, is, is making progress around its own goals. And again, coming back to the fact that grand challenges require overarching strategies, we, we don't need these silos. We need the silos to integrate into, into one vision. Now, the plant community can do well when it pools its resources and pools its thinking, and I wanted to call attention to a couple of examples of larger efforts that have really made a difference. For example, the Joint Genome Institute, which is, uh, which is affiliated with the Department of Energy, has produced an enormous amount of plant uh, sequence data. So not, NSF, for example, was responsible for getting the corn genome sequence, but the Joint Genome Institute continues to produce DNA sequences from a wide variety of plants, microorganisms, and other organisms. This is a place where the, the, the fastest, the most recent technology can all be pooled at the service of the plant community rather than farming out uh, and perhaps even duplicating um, uh, uh, discoveries across um, the world or across the country. The Complex Carbohydrate Research Center is also a Department of Energy funded a laboratory located at the University of Georgia. It has a long track record of successful analysis for outside users and inside users. Of, of molecules that require specialized equipment and techniques and expertise in order to analyze. And this is not just a plant biology center, it's, it's a service of, of anybody who needs to use it. Again, an example where pooling technologies and resources in a single location can be a, an economical, efficient uh, way of doing science in a way that moves science forward for the whole community. 
Another example is the Plant Research Laboratory at Michigan State University where they've coalesced not around a, um, a technology per se, but a process which is photosynthesis, again providing services to the plant community um, where photosynthesis is an important object of study, but maybe not something that can be set up uh, in its entirety in a given uh, a location. I also want to call attention to NSF's Plant Genome Research Program, an ongoing program that's been around for about 15 years. Again, because of the size of the investment and the focus of the program, the impact on plant biology and on life sciences has been absolutely tremendous. And the National Plant Genome Initiative, which is a, 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 a tri-agency working group that underpins in part the uh, NSF Plant Genome Research Program, again, shows an example of where, in this case, federal agencies can get together to advance a cohesive agenda that, again, makes a huge difference uh, as far as building a foundation for uh, the rest of plant biology. So I think the plant community can point to success stories in instrumentation and in programs to say, yes, if you invest, um, you get a return on that investment and it makes a difference in society and it makes a difference for sciences. So let me just come to very briefly summarize how we got to this decadal vision that you got in your hand. So first of all, Howard Hughes Medical Institute as well as uh, NSF, USDA, and DOE have supported this, and ASPB, and American Society for Plant Biologists, have been with us all along and continue to work with us to implement this vision. In, the, in uh, September 2011, I was one of uh, a, a large number of participants in the Phase I Summit, which was held at HHMI. I'll come back to that. Phase II was held in January this year. As you can see, the report you're holding was published in 2013 and rolled out at ASPB's national meeting. And here we are in December 13. Next year, early next year, we'll be um, rolling it out uh, to Congress in the form of a briefing, again, trying to educate our legislators about the promise um, and opportunities in plant sciences. So the first summit, which was held in 2011, was pretty large. I was one of over 140 participants. Some, uh, some people in the audience here were at that as observers. It was a, a very interesting group of people, very broad uh, uh, from um, you know, the media, from the agencies, et cetera, from the commodity groups. And it, it turned into an idea mill. So we had lectures and breakout sessions. Everybody got excited. There was lots and lots of ideas. Um, the problem is that we never got, quite got around to making those tough choices. So if you look at a menu on a restaurant and you never decide, you don't get dinner. So this group needed <laughs> to get dinner. So we had this, uh, uh, this first summit, um, large menu of ideas, and that was published as something called the Green Frontier. And if you're interested in seeing the broad swath of ideas developed, in that summit, which uh, Gary Stacy was a brainchild, then uh, you can look up the Green Frontier Report. So in phase two, uh, which Sally and I co-organized on behalf of the community, we had 17 participants, a much smaller number, each one chosen uh, for diversity and their ability to think above, uh, above the tactics, to think of maybe 10,000 feet about where the plant science community was and where it needed to go. Uh, we had those reports that I mentioned earlier um, as our impetus. We knew that this was important nationally and internationally, and we met for a day and a half at HHMI with a facilitator, an outsider who, who uh, was a very good cat herder. She could herd scientists, after all, probably great with cats. And we used a kind of a strategic planning process, a very traditional one, so people were interviewed in advance. There were outside interviews conducted. Uh, we started with a mission and vision for the plant science community, the principles, and so on, and finally got down to the research agenda, which is what most scientists feel comfortable with. So it was important for the scientists to really think at a higher level about where we wanted to go, why this was important, what the plant community really needed to believe in, and then get on to the tactics. <clears throat> and most importantly, the community, the plant community at large, was invited in a number of ways through social media and other ways to give us their input before the summit and after the summit, and in fact, there's still a blog site that the plant community can use, and every once in a while we get a comment, often a pointed comment, but that input is absolutely critical as this uh, living document um, will, uh, will go forward in the next decade. So what is the bottom line of the decadal vision? You can see that here, to create crops that are flexible and adaptable to the challenges of environment and population. So this is really the response, the agriculture response, if you will, to the challenges of population and climate that we have. So how do we accomplish that everything before the comma? We have to increase the predictive and synthetic abilities of plant biologists. We can't do things in an old-fashioned way. We have to be really smart about our science. And what you're going to hear today um, is how we can be smarter, how we can use data that we can so easily generate to make better predictions about how plants function, to understand what they can do, what they do in nature, and then use that knowledge, if you will, at the service of society and the environment. So how do we preserve biodiversity while increasing our food output, for example, 
these are, are huge challenges that the plant community is, is absolutely key to helping us meet. So uh, just to drill down very briefly into what's in the decadal vision, we uh, have five goals. One of them is predicting plant traits from genomes. And uh, our this two speakers from now, Pat Schnabel, will address this from the point of view of big data. Uh, once we know a genome, that's only a beginning, what happens after that. Um, we also have an objective to really understand much more about plant chemistry than we understand today. And the speaker following me, Tony Kutchen, will take you through a number of vignettes about plant chemistry, which are absolutely fascinating. You may not realize the impact that plants have on your everyday life. So this should be very interesting uh, for all of you. And then uh, once we understand what plants do, and how to predict what they do, we can use those discoveries uh, to solve problems, as it says in number three. And number four is the big data problem. Again, big data is not a plant-specific problem. It's a, it's a problem across biology. Uh, we are very good at collecting data. Uh, what do we do with it? How do we find the patterns? How do we understand it? And last but not least, um, I mentioned earlier the pipeline. The pipeline is absolutely critical. And the, the Decadal Vision group decided to focus on graduate training, because graduate training is a place where the pipeline is very, very leaky, leaky both in terms of diversity and in, in terms of numbers. And uh, Sally McKenzie is going to finish up by talking about uh, some of the issues involved in graduate training in the life sciences and how we propose at least one aspect of a solution uh, to that problem. So I want to just say that since it's been rolled out, we've been very pleased at the reception that Decadal Vision has had. The membership gave us some feedback. It's been used um, on Capitol Hill, where uh, legislators want to be informed about plant biology as they make decisions on the Farm Bill or on other funding um, opportunities um, that, as Washington debates where those precious dollars should go. It's been discussed, in, and we've had excellent feedback from program officers and leaders of various science agencies, and we're really grateful for that interaction. We think that they appreciate um, hearing from the plant community, if you will, as a group, and we appreciate the opportunity to educate them about what the plant community thinks. And there have also been a number of academic institutions that have already latched onto the decadal vision as a way to think about how they want to make their investments as they go through faculty renewals as the baby boomers retire, who is going to take the reins at the universities and, and research institutions, where is that next generation of science is going, and how should they invest their dollars. So we've been very pleased to see those responses and glad that the report's been able to be of use um, to some people. And um, it is a living document, as I mentioned. We'll probably revisit this report in about three years or four years and ask the plant community if it's on track, um, what we need to change, what we need to do next. We even have a QR code, and we have a website, as I said, with the blog. So I'm going to pass um, the baton to Tony Kutchen. Tony is the uh, Vice President for Research at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center in St. Louis. Tony, tell us all about plant chemistry. Good afternoon. I would like to thank you also for finding time to come and listen to our, our story about our decadal vision for plant science for the, uh, the coming years. We have global challenges that are in our national interest that we are facing now, a growing population. We have to find ways of feeding more people with the same amount of arable land with the same amount of resources that we've had in the past, and in some cases with limited resources, we have to find a way of clothing this growing population. Uh, we have declining resources in some sense. If one would consider amounts of fresh water that we use in agriculture, what Sally had mentioned to you, fertilizer is a concern. Oil reserves are declining. You can argue about how long it takes, but they are declining, and eventually prices will be very high with these declining resources. We're facing a changing environment. This means that we have to be able to feed that growing population and clothe that growing population in a changing environment. So there's going to be new pressures on agriculture as we go forward. We have to find new sources of energy as we go forward also, new sources of fuels, electricity. We would argue to you that there are solutions to these global challenges, very elegant and very sustainable solutions to be found in plants. Plants are, are truly amazing in what they're faced it's the challenges they're faced by, how they counteract, how they, how they adjust to the changes that 
they're um, exposed to in their environment. So what I want to do is give you some short stories about the kinds of things that we know about plants, the kinds of things that we use plants for in our everyday life, and some of the stories are amazing, and also to give you quite spectacular examples of how plants have adjusted to their changing environments to challenges in their environment, and want to point out to you again that we think solutions to a lot of the problems that we face can already be found out in nature in plants. And so we just have to understand better how plants are dealing with their environment in order to be able to exploit. In many cases, we just have observations that we're making, but we don't have in-depth understanding. And as part of our, our uh, decadal vision, we're going to propose to understand in detail much, much more about plants and plant interaction with the environment. Um, so am I going here? Plants are central to our everyday lives. Now, some of these slides will seem a little bit simplistic to you, but in fact, plants are producing the oxygen in our environment. They're removing carbon dioxide from the air. That carbon dioxide is getting split up into oxygen, which is reduced back into the, uh, released back into the atmosphere, and they're fixing carbon, and from carbon, they're producing virtually millions of different of compounds. Now, we can use plants as alternate sources of fuel. Uh, we can burn that fuel. We can burn plants directly to produce energy. We release carbon dioxide back into the air, and this is this idea of carbon neutrality because then plants, again, refix carbon dioxide from the air. So it's a renewable source of fuel and energy. That's in its simplest sense. Again, plants are giving us the food that we eat. They're our source of carbohydrate, our main source of calories, whether you're on a wheat-based or a rice-based diet. Uh, plants are very, very important, even to people who would eat only meat. The animals that we have in agriculture are feeding on plants. So the original source of all our food material is also coming from plants. So not just carbohydrates, but minerals and, and uh, vitamins come to us also through plants. So we're getting sources of energy. Let's talk about fiber for clothing, if you would think of cotton and linen. Talk about carbohydrate as a source of energy and all the vitamins and minerals that we need all coming from plants. Plants also are chemists par excellence. They produce hundreds and hundreds of thousands of different kinds of chemicals and mankind has exploited these chemicals uh, over the millennia. Uh, some of these will be very well known to you, and you partake in them quite regularly. The most obvious example would be caffeine in coffee and tea. It's one of the many hundreds of thousands of chemicals that plants make. Uh, another example that might not be as well known to you is aspirin. Aspirin comes from originally from the willow tree, salicylic acid. We tweaked it a bit and acetylated it to produce aspirin. Again, plants as a source of health-promoting compounds also are original pharmacopoeias coming from plants. There's other examples that are very, very important to the pharmaceutical industry. We attain about 25% of our pharmaceuticals today either directly or modified forms of plant compounds, and, and these are hardcore pharmaceuticals. If you look at the examples, these are just some selected examples. Digitalis purpurea or the foxglove makes cardiac glycosides. This has been used since the 1700s. There was a, a British physician named William Withering who prepared teas from this plant and used it to treat people who were suffering from, at the time, was called dropsy. This is congestive heart failure. The cardiac glycosides improve the strength of the beating of the heart muscle as we age and our heart muscle weakens. Look over in the upper right-hand side, Hyoscyamus niger, and related plant species make a series of compounds, three of which are very important. One is called scopolamine. If you've seen people on boats who have Band-Aids behind their ears, the Band-Aid is soaked with this compound scopolamine. It's very effective against motion sickness as a dermal patch. Most of you have had atropine. If you've gone to the eye doctor and had an eye exam where your pupils have been dilated, you've had drops of atropine put in your eye or derivatives of atropine. Related compound is one of our most effective bronchial dilators. It's called atrovent. So three chemicals with very, very different medical uses coming from one plant. 
Bottom left here, Catharanthus roseus, the Madagascar periwinkle, produces compounds that are still some of our most effective treatments of childhood leukemia and not Hodgkin's lymphoma. Lower right-hand corner is Taxol from the Pacific yew tree. Taxol is used to treat originally refractive ovarian cancer. It's used against a number of different kinds of cancers. And again, important compounds with huge commercial importance. Taxol has a market value of about $4 billion a year. And what I would point out to you is that these examples that I've given you up here of these small molecules coming from plants are still isolated from the plants that produce them. Yes, we can chemically synthesize them, but not in commercially feasible ways. So we're still using plants as a source of extremely important medicinal compounds. Go on the lighter side, plants are used for structure. We build and look at all the wonderful wood in the lecture hall. In our homes, we get paper from plants also. These two compounds that we use the characteristics that give us wood and uh, paper, so lignin and cellulose, are plant-produced polymers. And even though these are the most abundant carbonaceous compounds on our earth, we still don't completely understand how these compounds are made in plants, and not well enough to predictively exploit them. So there's a lot to be learned there. Other examples of compounds coming from plants, resin from trees, the resin that is produced by pine trees is a protective compound to help protect the, uh, the tree against attack by beetles. Uh, this same resin is also what produces amber. Same types of compounds that one finds in resin are very, very important to the flavor and fragrance industry. Again, these are adding to our quality of life, our standard of living and personal care products in foods that we eat, in perfumes that we use, or, or in wonderful roses. All part of these hundreds of thousands of compounds that plants make. Some examples up here of other plant products that are important uh, to our cuisine, whether it's the scent of cinnamon, or the active components in ginger or turmeric that are health-promoting compounds. Vanilla, natural vanilla, comes from an orchid. Again, this wonderful, wonderful diversity. Well, that's how mankind has learned to exploit plants. But what we understand less about is why plants produce so many different kinds of compounds. Now, what we can say is that these compounds are there to communicate with the environment. Plants are sedentary, so they have to deal with their environmental situation just through the chemistry that they produce. And let's use the word communicate. Communicate means it can attract something beneficial to you. It can help you ward off something that's detrimental to you. Plants have incredible ways of adapting to their environment. And if we could learn to better understand this, catalog it, understand it at a genetic level, we can exploit it for improving our own crop plants. To give you a wonderful example, what you're looking at is wild tobacco. Tobacco, as you know, produces nicotine. Nicotine is a very effective insecticide. The tobacco plant up on the left, maybe the lights are a little bit too bright up here, you can't quite see it, are pollinated by a moth. The moth will lay eggs on the plant, larvae will hatch, caterpillars will start damaging the plant. When this happens, there's a cue that goes off in the plant and causes the plant midsummer to change the shape of the flower that it produces so that the moth can no longer feed on the nectar, but hummingbirds can because they have a much larger beak and they can reach down into this long tubular flower. Again, an incredible adaptation. This is a huge change to change the architecture of a flower midsummer in order to protect yourself. There's wonderful interactions that are involving three different levels, calling them tritrophic interactions, first discovered in corn. So the corn can be under attack by a caterpillar. The caterpillar releases in its spit a compound to the plant that signals the plant to send off volatiles into the environment. These are emergency signals that attract wasps, and the wasps are parasites on the caterpillar. They'll lay eggs on the caterpillar, those eggs hatch, and the larvae of the wasp destroy the caterpillar. So it's calling the enemy of your enemies in order to help survival. And we begin to understand that a number of plants use this kind of strategy in order to reduce insect attack. 
Again, we're looking at a, a changing environment. Our agricultural plants are facing new challenges. The bark beetle is a wonderful example of this. As the climate is warming in the Pacific Northwest, insects are surviving over winter that normally wouldn't. The insect pressure on the trees for producing wood has increased and there's a lot of damage. But again, we would argue that somewhere on the earth, there are plants that have already adjusted to these kinds of pressures and the answers to how we ward off insects grazing insects to how we ward off pathogens is already out there in nature and we just have to discover it. Plants like humans interact very integrally with microbes. Now I'm going to tell those of you who don't know that we as humans are about 10 times more bacterial cells than we are human cells. Our digestive system uh, is populated by bacteria that are important to our health. They aid in digestion. As we understand better the interaction between these bacteria and our own bodies, we see that they are related to certain kinds of diseases. They could be related to obesity. They are certainly off balance under conditions of malnutrition and are contributing to a general decline under those conditions. Plants have the same kinds of environments. There is a microbiome that's associated with plants. On the leaves, in the leaves, in the seeds, in the soil, around the root system. And we have to understand this better in order to understand plant fitness and to be able to exploit this. I'm gonna give you a, a classical example where we understand a little bit more about this kind of system, and that's the ergot fungus uh, Claviceps purpurea that infects the uh, seed or the grain of the rye plant and produces this sclerotia. Now the ergot fungus itself produces then toxic compounds. Historically, when Europeans were eating ergot fungus infected rye, they developed a terrible disorder called ergotism or St. Anthony's fire. Uh, what would end up happening is there would be an atrophy of the extremities. That people would lose fingers, hands, arms, toes, feet, and legs because of this. Today it still happens every once in a while around the world when rye hasn't been properly treated to prevent fungal growth on it. But mankind has learned to exploit this. We looked at what are these chemicals that are being produced by the fungus and we find very effective treatments for migraine and postpartum bleeding. So again, if we look to nature, we can find wonderful, wonderful chemicals and processes that we can exploit for mankind. Analogous to that, the morning glory. The morning glory produces these same kinds of compounds, and as it turns out, it's not the plant that's producing them, but it's an endosymbiotic fungus that's in the seed of the plant that's producing the chemicals. So it takes the level of complexity in the interaction of the plant, the growth of the plant, interaction of the plant with this environment to a new level. We have chemicals, that we should understand much better, that we should be cataloging potentially millions of them that can be exploited for different uses. We have other kinds of genetic interactions with the environment that we should be cataloging and understanding better. And then we should also be understanding how best to use these genes, how to synthesize plants with improved properties so that they will be more disease resistant, so that they will require less water, less fertilizer, and have a higher yield as we go forward. Also to learn how to produce many, many chemicals that we are today synthesizing from reduced petroleum. In general, we believe that there are about 400,000 plant species on this earth. Uh, we have used about 7,000 during history. Today, we use surprisingly little for 95% of our food and energy needs, only 30 plant species. But there's a lot of potential out there that we could exploit better than we do. Of these 400,000 plant species, chemists have looked at maybe 15% of them historically, and we already know many more than 200,000 different chemicals. It tells you what that diversity is. And again, about 25% of our pharmaceuticals come from plants. We believe that we should catalog this, catalog at least a subset of what is out there so that we can use this information as we go forward in the future. 
There's about 80,000 chemicals on our chemical register. About 70,000 of those we synthesize from reduced petroleum, either directly or indirectly. These are chemicals that are part of our standard of living, part of our everyday life, whether it's the plastic in your home, whether it's vitamins, whether it's food and drink components, whether it's clothing. As oil reserves reduce, the chemicals will become more expensive and we need alternate sources. And again, we believe those answers are already out there in nature, either already existing in plants or in a form that can be modified or using plants as production systems to reduce, uh, to replace those chemicals as we go forward. So again, a wonderful potential source of biofuels, of bioenergy, of biochemicals, in addition to the way that we use food, uh, as we've noted in the past. Now, plant science today to understand these interactions is big data science. We need robotics, we need high tech, we need high throughput. We generate a tremendous amount of data. And unless we want to be just stamp collectors, we have to have a way of interrogating the data sets that we're generating. Uh, this requires a change in thinking and technologies that we need as we go forward. And to tell you more about that, I'm going to turn the uh, microphone over to Pat Schnabel, who is director of the Genome Center at Iowa State University. Thank you, and good afternoon. I'm going to speak about uh, goal one of the Decadal Plan, which is making biology more predictive in the context of goal four, which is uh, embracing the, the, the change uh, associated with big data. Tony has talked about many uses of plants, and, and one that I want to particularly highlight is the impact that crops in particular have on our economy. So here we've got $135 billion of sales of just the agronomic crops. This doesn't include the horticultural crops, fruits and flowers and turf grasses. So crops have an enormous impact on the, on the U.S. economy. So that's, that's part of the good news. Um, over here on, this, on the left uh, plot, we have corn grain yields over time. And there is an inflection point around 1930. So yields were fairly stable. Yields per acre were fairly stable until the uh, mid-1930s with the advent of technological innovation. And this innovation was the, was the new field of statistics and proper experimental plot design. And that began a long curve of increasing yields, which was a combination of science, improved uh, plant breeding practices, as well as better husbandry or agronomic practices. The, the gain here is about equally from those two fields. Now, there are a number of inflection points here. I'm not going to go through those, but those are mostly due to advances in technology. So the curve got uh, steeper as we improved certain technologies, for example, bringing molecular markers to bear. So that looks good. Yields are increasing. For those of you that haven't lived in the, the Midwest, this is a, a grain elevator. So in good years, farmers harvest a grain, and they bring it to these elevators where they're stored. These are always adjacent to a railroad uh, track system. And the grain is stored in these elevators until it can be shipped to the customers. In very good years, we end up with piles of grain sitting outside of the elevators because there's not enough room for the grain in the elevators. To give you a sense of scale, that little, those two dots there are my wife and, and son, and they are of normal height. So <laughs> we've got a really strong agricultural system in this country. But there are, there are things to worry about. Uh, the plot on the, the right here, again, time is on the x-axis. Um, the y-axis is, is constant dollars, so inflation is not part of this curve. And this is investment of the private sector in R&D, seed industry, investment in R&D over time. And what we can see is that the investment in constant dollars is increasing, and yet uh, yield is increasing in a linear manner, which what that means is it's costing more to make every incremental gain. This is of concern within the context of what Tony talked about. We have increasing demands of the products of agriculture. We have less land to do it on. Agricultural inputs are becoming more expensive, and we're discovering uh, the environmental impacts of some of those uh, and undesirable ecological impacts of some of those inputs. And this is the one that really scares me, which is maintaining yield stability in, in an era of global climate change. Our agricultural systems were developed under very stable weather patterns. And as weather becomes more variable due to climate change, our agricultural systems will begin to fail if we don't do something about it. So, the federal government has invested substantial sums of money in sequencing crop genomes, in part to address these challenges. 
And the way we, the way I and others uh, pitched the value of these genome projects, uh, we compared uh, sequencing the genome, deciphering the genetic code of a, of a plant, to developing a user's manual for the corn plant. And this uh, turned out to be a, a flawed analogy. A much better analogy would have been a wiring diagram. Once we started looking at these, these complete genome sequences of, of plants, we uh, found a lot of information. There clearly are lots of connections. Uh, many things depend on many other things. There are sensors. There are interactions. But unless you're an electrical engineer, this doesn't make a lot of sense. So we're now faced with the challenge of deciphering and translating those genomic investments into true understanding of plant biology. And there are a number of ways to do this. I'd like to uh, highlight one of them, but first I want to make this point that um, Evogene, which is a, an Israeli company, recently went public and uh, raised, uh, actually this number is an underestimate, something on the order of $80 million. So there's a recognition in the marketplace that there's great value in deciphering the genetic control of traits. So one of the mechanisms for making those associations, for deciphering which genes control traits and how they do it, is something called uh, association studies, or guilt by association. And to illustrate what this means, I'm going to uh, go to an Alfred Hitchcock movie, which some of you may have seen, uh, Shadow of a Doubt. There's uh, Teresa Wright's uh, character here is a young woman who's still living at home. She has an uncle who she just adores. He travels around the world. Maybe he's a university professor. I'm not, I'm not sure. But, uh, she, she adores him. And for those of you that are younger, um, he, he would mail her postcards during his travels. And these were pieces of paper where you'd print an email out on the, the one side. <laughs> and then there was a postage, uh, a postmark put on it. And this would tell the location and the date at which this postcard or email was sent. She was also a real fan of the news. And there was at this time a, a series of murders going on. Uh, there was the so-called Mary Widow Murderer. This guy would go out and uh, romance women and then knock them off and make off with their money. And she developed this hypothesis. She was looking at the postmarks of Uncle Charlie's postcards and the dates and locations of the murders, and she noticed a really good correlation. So she had the hypothesis that Uncle Charlie was the murderer, and she tested the hypothesis by confronting him with her, uh, her, uh, her data, and he ran, which uh, in her mind convinced her that, in fact, he was uh, the murderer. So, Association studies, which are widely used in the biomedical community as well as the agricultural world, associate differences in DNA, or SNPs, and genes with traits. So this is a way of identifying and determining which genes control traits that matter to us. In order to do this, we need at least two things. We need good genotyping data, so we need large populations, and we need to genotype those populations so we know what DNA differences exist. And then we need good phenotypic data. We need trait data. We need to know how these organisms differ in the way they grow and develop or respond to the environment. So I'm going to start by talking about genotyping data. This is a, uh, a challenge that has essentially been solved, and it's been solved by the next generation sequencing revolution. This is a plot over time of uh, the cost of sequencing a given unit of DNA. And this, I'll point out in case you can't see it, is a log scale, uh, y-axis. So starting around uh, 2007, there has been a precipitous drop in the cost of sequencing. This was driven by technological innovation that itself was an outgrowth of the Human Genome Project, and it has benefited all of biology. Number of uh, so-called next-generation sequencing instruments that can pump out vast amounts of data. And I want to, because this is a discussion within the context of big data, I want to illustrate really how much data comes out of one of these things. So a single one of those Illumina HiSeq instruments will uh, generate for about $3,000 and in about a week 40 million base pairs of DNA sequence. Now to put that in context, I'm going to do a little thought experiment with you. Is we're going to print the data. So if we spend three grand, we get 40 million base pairs. How much paper would it cost to print those 40 million base pairs? Well, those of us that write grant proposals know exactly how many characters we can fit on a page of paper. <laughs> If we divide that number into that big number, we end up with 16 million pieces of paper, which is 32,000 reams, which is a pile of cases that would fill a room 16 by 16 by 16. Now, we still need to get the data off the hard drive, so we have to find a very fast printer. This one does uh, a lot of pages uh, per minute, and it, we need a replaceable cartridge every 24,000 pages. So if we connect that printer up to the hard drive, and we wait 222 days, we have our data on paper. 
The problem is, in the university systems, we have to pay for everything now, so we have to pay for the paper and the cartridges, so that comes for $300,000. So it costs 100 times more to print the data as it does to generate it. This is truly a big data era. This is one machine in one week. There are hundreds of these instruments scattered across the globe, and they're all running 24-7. So vast amounts of genotyping data are being generated. We can convert uh, sequence data can be converted into genotyping data very easily. Okay, so that one we've got uh, actually pretty, uh, we've got it under good control in terms of generating the data at least. The second piece we need for association studies is good phenotyping or trait data, and this is more challenging. So I'm going to give you a couple of case studies that I'm familiar with um, in terms of how instead of having uh, a graduate student in a field with a yardstick or uh, another person looking through a microscope and counting things, we're automating the process of collecting phenotypic data. So we're very interested, uh, our lab as well as other ones, in studying the phenomenon of heterosis, which is really what drives the seed industry. If you choose the right two parents and you cross them together, you make a hybrid. And if you choose properly, the, choose the parents properly, the hybrid will outperform the progeny substantially. This is a phenomenon called heterosis. We've known about it for a long time. It was part of that uh, change in slope in the increase of yields beginning in the 1930s. So we're interested in understanding the molecular mechanisms behind this. We're part partnering with Edgar Spaulding at the University of Wisconsin who has a bank of cameras. So we provide him with several hundred genotypes, each of which we've, uh, we have extensive sequence information for each of these genotypes. They're both the inbreds and the hybrids. And he germinates these seedlings in the presence of this bank of cameras and then takes a photograph every three minutes for three hours, which allows us to study the rate at the speed of uh, root growth. And also, uh, we can also look at gravitropism here. But the point is, it's, so ultimately, we're going to be able to associate DNA differences with the rate of root growth as a model for understanding heterosis. But this, gen this little experiment, and this is a little experiment, uh, generates 150,000 images, each of which must go through an image processing uh, pipeline to extract the root length and hence, if we, inter if we look across a time series, the rate at which roots are growing. So that's big data. Here's another one. This is a project funded by the USDA, uh, working with my colleague Lee Tang, who's an engineer. He's taken a standard garden tractor. This is the Midwest. I suspect your yards are not as big here, but this is a standard garden tractor. He's put a, a GPS unit on here, as well as an auto steer unit. So this is an autonomous vehicle, as well as a uh, bank of sensors here. So this can drive through the field. We can put any kind of sensors we want, what we want on, and it can image we can image the plants as, we, as the robot drives through the, through the field. A wide range of sensors. But basically what happens is this auto-steered autonomous vehicle drives up and down the rows, collecting image data from the adjacent plants. That, those data can come back. Uh, there's onboard computing here, but we bring back the hard drives to the lab and do image analysis. And we can collect substantial amounts of phenotyping data. So we can do it on an unprecedented scale. We can uh, also uh, do it with higher accuracy than somebody standing there with a yardstick. So we can look at uh, plant height and growths of growth rate and leaf angles and leaf width, those sorts of things. So those two projects are still in the midst of analysis. I want to give an example of a project that has uh, been completed. This is one where we didn't use automated phenotyping. This was manual graduate students and undergraduates measuring the trait. The trait here is kernel row number. So these are cross sections of ears and the number of rows is, is measured in the cross-section just by counting the number of kernels that we see here. That's an important yield component trait. So this is a trait that matters to the breeders. And we did one of these large-scale association studies. And I want to give you, again, the scale of the data that come out of this. So 7,000 different lines, each of which was genotyped with 13 million SNPs. And we measured the trait 100,000 times. And from that large-scale analysis, we were able to identify 200 DNA differences that are associated with this trait, this yield component trait. These can then go into a breeding program and actually speed the rate of genetic gain. They can help the breeders make advancement in, in yield. But this highlights this, this context that I think is extremely important of big data. We are being flooded with massive amounts of data. And it's important. This is a good thing. But we need to make sure that we properly utilize these uh, massive amounts of data. And the, the decadal uh, vision for seeds plant science is using the approaches of big data 
to develop models that enable the prediction of phenotypes uh, based on both genotypes and environmental data. The great thing about these big data is they help us develop hypotheses more quickly, testable hypotheses. So, goal one of the Takedal vision is to be able to make biology, plant biology, more predictive. We want to be able to predict the phenotype from the genotype and the environment. Well, the genotype, as I say, we can measure that very well. We can partner with engineers to get sensors and high-quality environmental data. And I don't just mean the temperature and the, the humidity and the rainfall, but the soil type and uh, the agronomic practices, plant density, all the, all the features of the environment that can affect plant growth. So it would be one thing if, if those two characteristics by themselves controlled phenotype, but they also interact in complex ways to control phenotype. And that's illustrated in the, the next slide. And this is a, this is a, a new piece of software that I, I purchased uh, recently. And it produces graphs that look like they were made on your iPhone, or photographed, drawn by hand, and then photographed with your iPhone on the plane flying into DC. <laughs> but the, what we've done here in this, uh, in this experiment is we have a number of environments, and we've ranked those by the amount of stress that the plants are experiencing. So we have low stress environments and high stress environments. And then we have the yield in those various environments. And most lines behave like line number one. They give uh, high yield under low stress, and as the stress increases, the yield uh, declines. But what we can see is different lines have different patterns here. So that uh, inbred three, or hybrid number three, um, under high stress, this line is actually the winner. But in a low stress environment, it's not the winner. We're finding changes in the rank of lines depending on the environment. This is the interaction between genotype and phenotype. And this makes everything about doing predictive plant science much harder. But I am optimistic that we can accomplish this goal as a community. This is a um, large public-private partnership. I'm working with Natalia De Leon at the University of Wisconsin. She has uh, marshaled about two dozen classical plant breeders in the public sector, and we're partnering with the private sector in a large public-private partnership where genotypes, several hundred genotypes with known, several hundred inbreds and hybrids with known genotypes are planted at uh, dozens and ultimately hundreds of environments. Each environment will be carefully measured, phenotypes will be carefully measured at all of these, and then we can build statistical models that allow us to predict the performance of a given hybrid of known genotype in an environment that is uh, relatively well characterized. We should be able to predict the yield. There's another approach. So that was basically the Netflix uh, challenge model. So some of you may have heard about this. Uh, if you sign on to Netflix and you've been a user and you've ranked uh, videos, uh, movies, um, it will predict which movies uh, you might like. It's actually really good at predicting which movies you won't like, in my experience. And if we can do that for the plant breeders, that, that by itself would be an enormous advantage to be able to get rid of the dogs before they even get started with field tests, because the field tests are much more expensive than the genotyping and the statistics. But there's another approach here, and this is something that's championed by some engineers that plant scientists are partnering, which is to build models based on first principles. So we understand, they understand, how fluids move in, in channels and tubes. Can we model roots and whole plants and actually develop models of plants that are based on first principles? Both of these approaches, though, the statistical black box approach as well as the first principle model construction, will develop, will lead us to new hypotheses, which can actually be tested in controlled environments, um, often using model systems. So here we have a, a schematic where we have a number of growth chamber rooms where we can control the environment with great uh, precision. We can imagine that these change, each room has a one degree temperature difference. And we have some sensors uh, in a central room. We can then uh, test the hypothesis that a particular genotype, a particular gene, is controlling response to heat stress by putting the same genotypes, uh, of a set of genotypes, in these chambers and then measuring the response uh, to the change in temperature. So if we are successful with goals one and four of the decadal uh, plan, what we'll be able to do is we will be able to make plant science considerably more predictive. We will be able to improve the accuracy of selection and plant breeding, which will increase the rate of genetic gain per year, which, as I've said, is a really critical thing if we're going to meet the world's needs for agricultural products. We'll also enhance our ability to efficiently breed crops that withstand the increased weather variability that's coming uh, with climate change. And this is something uh, in Iowa, when I talk to the, the farmers there, they understand this. They recognize that the farms that they're going to pass on to their children and grandchildren will be in a different climatic zone than they're farming in right now. This resonates very well. And it's also really important. Uh, improves, we'll also be able to improve the abilities of farmers to predict 
or to select which varieties, which hybrids to plant in a given field in a given year under their particular management practices. And we'll Im Im improve our ability to actually predict yields during the growing season or even before planting so that we can help even out the uh, spikes and valleys, the volatility of commodity prices. If we're going to be successful with, these, uh, with meeting these goals, though, we are going to need uh, a different model for training the next generation of scientists. And Sally's going to talk about uh, some of those aspects. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to uh, uh, close our presentation. And that has to do with the fact that, as Pat has pointed out, as everyone here has pointed out, um, to let this uh, new uh, era happen for plant science is going to require scientists to be trained in very different ways. So as Pat pointed out, you can't do modern plant breeding without modern plant breeders. You can't do big uh, data without scientists who are computationally trained. And you know, not everyone now, we recognize, will be working in scientific careers that look like the careers that we ourselves have taken. Uh, so we will have to think about the scientist who's now going to be the innovator and perhaps even the entrepreneur and the individual who's starting their own company rather young. Uh, we're going to have to think about the scientist who's going to have different communication skills uh, than the scientists we have now. And we have not really put that scientific uh, work for, excuse me, workforce in place. So uh, the last challenge, of course, is with regard to the path forward, thinking through what the next generation of plant scientists should look like and the type of training that they're going to need. And that has to do a lot, uh, has a lot to do with our staying competitive as we see more and more PhDs being trained from other countries and fewer and fewer PhDs being trained uh, within the US. So as we think about uh, where we are starting about 2009 to present, we see uh, doctoral awards that are in decline in terms of their numbers. And we see the largest decrease, unfortunately, in agricultural sciences. Although we see a certain amount of gain in computational sciences, we don't necessarily have those in computational sciences associated with biology that will be directly interfacing with the kinds of challenges that we're describing. And as we think about international trends in doctoral training, and you see uh, China and other countries with a huge increase in the number of PhDs they might be turning out, you see us over toward the right with uh, only about 2.5%. In terms of the, the rise in doctoral training, it's not necessarily happening here to supplement our own workforce. And part of this has to do perhaps with the degree of satisfaction that students feel in the doctoral programs that we've uh, currently had them in. And what we find is that as students start in their first year, they're extremely excited about their prospects. But by the time we get them to their fifth year, they're not so excited about the prospects any longer. And um, what we find in general is that a lot of students, the very best and the brightest, are not necessarily choosing careers in science and technology and math and engineering. And what we're also finding is that among those students who are particularly dissatisfied, many of them are women. So this is overall a problem that we're going to have to change. And we're going to have to change these overall trends. And one component of this, um, as we uh, down here in the lower panel is basically just talking about uh, the surveys that are taken as students start out knowing precisely what they want to do with their careers and as they go further into their training, feeling less and less assured of the type of career they want in science. So we've proposed also as part of the uh, decadal vision uh, new trends in training. Uh, we, we've uh, called that the T-training model. And basically, we call it the T-training model because it involves adding what we refer to as horizontal skills to the traditional vertical skills. We have drilled down rather quickly with students. They become myopic rather quickly and becoming specialists in exactly the skills they'll need to be laboratory-based scientists. 
They're great at designing experiments and testing hypotheses and even writing grant proposals, but they're not necessarily so great in their broader communication skills. They're not terribly good in their business skills, their entrepreneurial skills, um, and their computational skills. So having a broader uh, base of training is something that we think is going to have to be uh, vital to creating the next uh, our community of scientists for the next generation. And of course, part of this is going to have to be new and uh, more imaginative ways to reduce the time to degree and reduce the post-degree training time before these people get into the careers that they're going to choose. And that, of course, may also impact our ability to retain more women in more satisfying careers and to a higher level of achievement than a lot of women have been able to um, in the current model that we present. So with that, um, I think what we'd like to do is to open to discussion and to hear from you in terms of what you think of the decadal vision, what you think of the plans that we're putting forward for the scientific community um, in order to uh, provide us with feedback and to give us a chance to explain the position that uh, uh, was taken with this uh, community-based uh, effort to develop uh, a plan for the next 10 years. So with that, I would like to open to questions for all of our speakers. Please. So maybe that's toward David. Where is the microbiome in this Where picture? Where is the microbiome? Um, I don't know. Is this on? Yes. yes. Um, that's a great question. And in fact, during the summit, um, I think even though I know almost nothing about the microbiome, I had just read about this 10 to 1 ratio of bacterial cells to human cells in my own body. And I was absolutely fascinated by it. And I went back to my own, own institute and I told the one person I have works on mycorrhizal fungi that she really ought to work on the microbiome. She said, yes, yes, I already thought about that. Here's what I want to do. Um, plant scientists recognize it's important. Um, there's been a number of publications on a microbiome, particularly the root and the soil microbiome. Um, it is in there. It's not a headline. Uh, we talk about, when we talk about plant environment interactions, a traditional plant biologist might think about environment as, as water, as salt, nutrients and so on. <clears throat> when we refer to environment, we say all of the environment, and we're talking about the soil microbes, we're talking about the endophytes and the microbiome. I think it would be an excellent program if a science agency chose to fund it to really focus on the microbiome of plants, because it's not simply how, for example, they acquire nitrogen and phosphorus, but it's also the chemistry of plants. As you heard from Tony, there's probably untold numbers of examples where the chemistry we attribute to plants is really attributed to endophytes. So. Um, if it's not explicit enough in there for you, apologize, um, but it is in there. I can find it for you, and it absolutely is one of the things we think is one of the most exciting frontiers in plant science. I'm Heaven Z. I'm from the University of Maryland. I'm a professor there, and I teach plant biology. So I'm concerned about the training that you're envisioning. Um, a lot of, I think, motivation for grad students is to be creative, to do something that is their own. So in this picture of big science, I do not see how you might have this individual ability to create and, and do something. So I want to know how you envision training within this big science, big data type of program? So one of the things that, uh, I'll take a stab at this first, one of the things that we made um, great effort to do was to not be overly prescriptive of exactly what this training is gonna look like because what the decadal vision is intended to be is a starting point for our discussions within the community. So what we envision is that um, if, if all goes well, um, we're envisioning that perhaps um, 
uh, agencies like NSF and others will hold additional meetings of educators, people who are very thoughtful in these areas as to how to implement more um, thoughtful and effective ways to train. But again, um, the, the number of scientists that we have put out that will occupy the types of jobs that we currently occupy, you know, the, the, the climate is changing. The, the uh, um, opportunities for where scientists will have their impact will change. The environment will change in which they're going to be working. And so we simply have to keep up with the times. You know, as we talk about the plant breeding training, you know, we know how to train plant breeders right now. It's just simply that our plant breeding methods haven't kept pace with the science. And to some extent, you know, we have to train a broader range of scientists to occupy a broader range of, um, you know, a skill bases that they're going to have to have than what we have now. So it doesn't mean that science is going to get less imaginative or that the scientific training at the graduate level isn't going to be, um, you know, as, as deep as it is now. It simply means that students, more is going to be required in terms of a breadth of capability than um, our own uh, colleagues currently have. Let me, let me uh, also respond. I mean, I think you've tapped into a primal fear of many of us who have you know, been in science for a while, and, and that is the, the, dis, the apparent disappearance of the single investigator hypothesis driven grant. Um, the, the decadal vision is not meant as a substitute for mechanistic investigations of one gene or one protein at a time or whatever you want to call it. That kind of science absolutely needs to continue. It's the foundational science that is going to be required to understand aspects of big data. We're still going to need to study individual genes and processes. I think students are going to have to choose what kind of work they want to do in their PhD. Some of them will want to choose what, what you might call traditional, um, uh, very focused hypothesis-driven research, and they certainly should have those opportunities. But I've been actually surprised to see, perhaps I shouldn't have been surprised to see, the evolution of faculty of people who now think in very different ways. Their thinking is very broad and maybe not as deep and as focused as I was brought up to do. I don't think there's a right and a wrong there. I think those two models are going to coexist. And so I don't think we should assume that you know, all graduate students were going to want to do that kind of work, but I think we should assume that some will and they should be given that opportunity. So this is a, a wonderful topic I think that uh, many of us are concerned about and have been thinking about. I want to give you an example from the Danford Center where a group of graduate students and postdocs form their own maker group. So now today when you want to answer a question in plant biology, uh, you have the opportunity to do it in a big data way and they've chosen to do this and they're designing their own robot to do the phenotyping of the plants in order to answer a particular question. So the creative process I think is there and it's broadening. So now it's not working only in a traditional way. You're still trying to get at that important gene or subset of genes, but we want you to think in a really big way and if you need to create a piece of equipment in order to answer your scientific question, you should go ahead and do it. So it's an exciting time, I think, and, and the group is doing absolutely wonderful things in their little creative environment and designing various kinds of phenotyping equipment. Hi, my name's Ari Novi. I'm from the United States Botanic Garden, just down the street. I'd like to say we have every one of the plants that was mentioned in the, uh, <laughs> on the slide on medicinal plants, and it's a, it's a big thing that the community re responds to the public loves. Um, I'd like to applaud everybody who worked on this. This is a hard thing to do and an amazing uh, second step, I guess, at this point. And so thank you for being here and explaining things to us. I also want to focus on the education component um, in a self-serving and personal way. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those recent plant biology graduate students who got a PhD and left academia. Um, and, uh, and while I absolutely applaud the, the, the focus on upgrading uh, the PhD concept um, and, and all the ways that are discussed, I do believe that uh, the comment was made earlier on that not the best and the brightest are necessarily all coming into plant and agricultural sciences from the get-go. And improving the PhD process is really not going to deal directly with the problem of people 
not coming in, you know, the, the students who are, who are the very fantastic students who are maybe being attracted to investment banking or whatever the best and brightest go on to these days, are, that this is not going to affect that. There's a major demographic problem. A lot of graphs were shown that talked about um, um, certain issues in, in the history of plant science. But the big demographic shift that was not represented was that the United States in about 1900 was maybe 60, 65% rural and 35% urban. And today we're about 80% urban. Um, and 20% rural, and all of the activity that, that we're talking about, whether it's at land-grant universities or the actual growing or breeding of plants themselves, is happening in that flyover zone of the United States. Um, and I think it's really critical that the people who understand the most about plants, who care most about plants, who recognize their prominence and importance in the, in, in the, as the foundation and fabric, uh, literally, of, of our society, uh, make a, a, an appeal to those who live in the urban environment. Um, and I'm, I'm really curious, uh, it's a big part of what I do in my every day, into how the research community and the organizations like ASPB and the, and the Tri Societies and others are really working hard um, to leveraging um, these kinds of efforts towards that particular issue. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, and, and those are really good points about how we um, repackage and educate and um, hopefully entice um, you know, the best and the brightest to think, not necessarily just about plants, but just about changing their world through science in ways that they maybe didn't uh, think about earlier on. It's, it's almost like the, the new form of the Peace Corps, you know, getting people to think a little bit about the implications of discovery and the implications of their activities. And this is one of the things that I would hope will um, be part of what comes from uh, the uh, council, the, the National Plant Science Council, that will be a component of this uh, decadal vision, and that is bringing scientists together who will basically shepherd the um, decadal vision forward. And along those lines, that, that shepherding will have uh, a, a, an education component to it. And that's simply because um, there is a lot of misperception about what plant science is about. There's a lot of misperception about what agriculture is about for sure, and it's gonna be our job to um, redouble our efforts in, you know, in painting a new view. I do think that, I do find in my own classes that there is a, a cadre of students who do have a little of that um, perspective of I do wanna change the world, uh, just tell me how. I, I didn't see it, um, say, 15 years ago, when I was teaching the same class, but I do see it now, and perhaps part of that is uh, the fact that people are more and more um, cognizant of climate change. They're more and more cognizant of um, food issues and food security issues as well as environmental issues. So in that regard, there is that opportunity to capture their imagination and perhaps pull some of them in. But yeah, it's gonna be an uphill battle, and that's our job as educators is to um, use the decadal vision to inspire. I, I would just make the subsidiary point that we have to make sure that we don't think of plant science as agriculture. Plant, uh, for example, everything Tony talked about was not commodity crops. It was, um, it was the wonders of plants and the plants and medicine and so on. I think that distinction is important. And I think the other issue is really that students need to see the opportunities. And, you know, some of you sitting in the audience are great examples of of their, your proof that if you're not a professor, you're not a failure. You know, it doesn't mean you failed. <laughs> you know, you, you got a plant education and you're going off and you're doing a, maybe a different career and that's fine. So we want to train people, the five out of six PhDs that don't go on to run a lab, they're not begging under bridges, they're, they're having other careers. Maybe the professors are the ones who are going to be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so one has to see the opportunities. One has to recognize different definitions of success in, in the career and not make it an all or nothing proposition uh, for being like one's uh, mentor. Um, so I think, and, and the distinction between agriculture and plant science is important. Agriculture is a component of plant science, but certainly, um, you know, NIH, NSF, and DOE don't invest in plant science because, uh, uh, certainly it's not solely because of its importance in agriculture. Did you have something to say? I was just going to say that actually, I mean, you're right about the demographics. Um, so our College of Agriculture at Iowa State is actually recruiting students from the suburbs of Chicago uh, into the agronomy and plant science programs, and it, it's actually turning out to be very successful. But the other aspect of this is, in, in my 
among my graduate students, very few of them come from agricultural backgrounds. I actually take them out to farms every couple of years so that they can actually see what an American farm looks like, because most of them have never been on a farm. So, so I don't think it's quite so grim. Also, we call it the breadbasket rather than flyover zone. <laughs> Thank you. I'm uh, Darcy Gentleman from American Chemical Society. Um, there seemed to be a bit of a craze, I don't know, over the last 10, 15 years to take a systems approach. And anytime I hear about microbiomes, there seems to be that uh, ideal. But with big data, it seems to be more of a brute force, let's just grab everything and then sort of tease out the information. In, from an experimental design perspective, I wonder <clears throat> if there's a, a um, uh, like in this decadal approach, if if it's sort of, if there's a strong tendency, I guess, in either direction, is it is it the grab the information and then sort and learn how to sort once that's done? So how, kind of how particle physicists work, or is it this determination to typify and characterize and establish the system and then find what's of use? Like like many things, the answer is yes and no. Um, Proper experimental design is still important in the era of big data. If we design these experiments properly, we can get much more power out of the large data sets that we generate. I also highlighted this, uh, this other approach. I mean, you, you, you mentioned that it's, it's almost a black box, uh, at least some of what I spoke about. But there are also design models from first principles, which is a very different paradigm and equally important. And so I, I would see all of these coexisting and contributing to the ultimate achievement of the goal. But, but we would know if we succeeded in this, certainly if we can at least achieve um, agreement within the community for standard uh, um, experimental design as well as data uh, input. And that's simply because right now um, we can't necessarily mine across all of the data that is being collected simply because it isn't all standardized. So that would be one of the major goals of the decadal vision is regardless of how it gets uploaded, regardless of how... Um, you take your experimental approach, that there be a uniformity to it so that everyone can capture the value. I'm not going to stumble down the steps. <laughs> can you hear me? Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Go ahead. Thank you for that, Mary. Uh, we love vote of confidence. We like preaching to the choir. If that's what we're doing, that's always fun. Um, we really have a two-track approach. So the, Sally briefly mentioned the National Plant Science Council. This is a, a group of people drawn from the second summit group. That was 17 people. 12 people have signed on to be on the Plant Science Council. And our job is twofold. We have to maintain this plan as a living document. We have to stay in touch with the scientific community to make sure it represents the consensus that we claim. And we have two jobs. One is to keep the dialogue going with the funding agencies and the decision makers in Washington to make sure that the plant science community's views are known and so that the programs um, reflect uh, as appropriate the input that the community has given through this, through this council and through this vision. And the second is really what was referred to earlier about educating the public. I mean, the best movements are always grassroots movements where excitement builds from below and, there's, and it serves as a catalyst to get something done. Obviously, the country faces hard choices and where we're going to invest our dollars. And if plant science is going to get a fair slice of the pie, we've got to get people excited about it. So our next step is, is one, to sell the plan um, to the people who have the money and print the money. 
And <laughs> the other is to get the public excited and get them understanding uh, what plant science can do and must do for society. So that education campaign is, is, is tough. But we have social media. We have all the new media. The tools are out there. It's a matter of devising the right plan and carrying through with it. And indeed, it's what we were discussing before we came here to, um, to this briefing this afternoon. Anybody else want to take a step? I, I, I will say one thing, and that is that um, I do think in many regards that um, I at least have been surprised by how receptive an audience uh, we've had. And uh, part of that receptive audience, I, I'm not speaking so much in Washington, D.C., I'm just talking about in general, has come from a real um, thirst for information, clarifying information regarding all the misinformation, particularly with regard to agriculture and GM technologies, for example, climate change, et cetera. People just, you know, um, the, the average citizen really wants to know what they can believe and what they can't believe. And so I do believe that there's a receptive audience to learning more about the importance of plant science and the opportunities that their view of plant science, uh, which you know is largely restricted to GM technologies, that sort of thing, uh, can have. So that's sort of the open door, I think, for us to step in. And I'm hoping that the scientific community will rise to that challenge because I do think that people really want to hear. So we need to be smart and we need to put our time into uh, providing that information in an impartial, unbiased way, and I think the enthusiasm will be there. I think Americans in general you know, strive to be at the cutting edge. They want to see uh, technologies they can trust and they want to see the scientific community. You know, Americans love science, so I think we have to do our job, and we haven't for the longest time. Scientists don't see themselves as the communicators. We don't see ourselves as the educators in general. We'll stand in front of a classroom, but we won't necessarily go out, stand in front of the public. So I think that's our job as well. Let me just add that the four of us are up here because we're optimists. And, and the other 13 that were in the room in the second okay. summit were there because they were optimists. Now, you might say that this is a really crazy time to be an optimist, but... <laughs> I mean, kick us if you want, but that's what we believe, and, and we believe in the task that we've taken on, and, and that's a lot of what keeps us going. And I think optimism is, is it's, it's hard, but if you could be optimistic in times like this, why you could be optimistic any time? So uh, <laughs> we believe. I'm Elizabeth Prescott from the State Department. I just have a quick question. There's been a lot of talk about traditional, um, traditionally trained scientists. How, did you discuss at all sort of engaging with the DIY or the citizen science movement to help advance the field as well as build, um, not only just uh, to build interest, but also to build out the data needed, particularly in the urban areas and various others? I guess the short answer is we did not. Um, it, we, we focused on graduate training as far as our outreach part of the summit goes, but um, there, are good, there are great examples of that even in plant science. You have one at the Danforth uh, that, uh, yeah, you could talk about that. So let's, let's talk about it at the reception and ask how we might uh, bring that idea into our decadal vision implementation uh, plan. We just decided for purposes of prioritization that we would focus on graduate training. We didn't tackle the K to 12. We didn't tackle the public citizen aspect of science in, in the summit. You know, we're cognizant that we have to attract young people into science. And, and I think at, at many of our home institutions, we do have outreach and education programs where we go into the community down to the elementary school level, high school level, college student level, and also educating teachers. Uh, it is important to attract the best and the brightest into science. As, as you said, we can enhance graduate education, but it doesn't necessarily get us the type of people that we want. So it is cultivation at a very, very young age, but then it's also providing interesting career opportunities so that when people get their university or graduate degrees in plant science, they go on to fulfilling careers. Hi, I'm Ira Herrera. I'm an undergraduate at the University of Maryland. Um, what brought me into doing what I really wanted to do in, in research was uh, 
these basic questions. And a lot of what you guys are talking about is crops and medicines and stuff like that, but it's not so much the basic developmental biology, stuff like that. Is there also going to be a focus on that? So, so I used examples from crops because that's what I work in, but we're, we're a fundamental plant biology lab. We're, we're interested in understanding how that particular species grows and develops. The kernel row number, there's really, there are really interesting questions in how the ear develops and decides uh, how many rows. All of what I described with association uh, genetics and mapping could be done with oak trees. So if we were interested in ecological aspects of, of new, uh, in, of insects that are attacking oak trees, We've got large plantings of oaks in, in nature. We can genotype those. We can measure insect damage, the same sorts of fundamental questions. So we can ask fundamental questions, and we can do it with non-model species, and we can do it in an ecological context. I also mentioned earlier, I think in response to another question, that this is not a plan that is in, to replace traditional science. It's a vision of how to tackle some of the very complicated problems. So, I, I fully expect all of the science agencies to continue with their funding of basic science programs to individual investigators, for example. That, that's not going away. That's already there, though. I mean, our idea was to have a new vision, not to just repeat what was already being done and maybe done well. So just because you don't see it in our document doesn't mean that it won't be done or it shouldn't be done. We had to pick a slice of science that we felt was a compelling story for the next 10 years. It's not all the science that's going to be done. It's a, a piece of science that's going to be done. And in fact, I would even add that many of the questions that we would like to answer in the next 10 to 15 years won't be answered without that fundamental research. You're not going to get that phenotype to genotype relationship unless you understand the fundamental basics of epigenetics. We don't have that yet, and that's all very fundamental research. It'll be the same with metabolic biochemistry. You can't just catalog these things. You're going to have to understand the underlying basis for those pathways and what regulates them. So I think that's inherent to every part of what we've written here is that there's going to be a very fundamental component to the research. It's simply that. Remember that this document isn't written to the scientific community. This document is very much written to Congress and to policymakers. And policymakers don't think about metabolic pathways and what regulates them. They think about how does that impact our pharmaceutical industry, or how does that impact our ability to develop better and healthier crops? So you speak both languages at one time. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming and uh, for your feedback. <laughs>